This is Shavuot Unbound, mini-episode 2, The Future of Shavuot. Welcome back for another episode in our series on Shavuot. I guess we've been exploring holidays over the course of our Judaism Unbound podcast, and it's really this question of what would it look like for the holidays to undergo a transformation along the lines that they underwent over the course of time. And in our last episode, we talked about how Shavuot evolved over the course of time and has become what it has become or what it became in late 20th century American Judaism. And the question is basically, you know, what is it today and and where might it go in the future in order to be the holiday that we need it to be? What excites me largely about the future tense conversation of Shavuot is that at least for many of us, Shavuot was not central in our Jewish lives in any meaningful way. I I didn't know. I mean, I heard the word Shavuot, but I didn't I didn't actually celebrate the holiday in any way at all until I was in college, and that's in in certain senses I'm sad about that. I think it's a great holiday. I think it's actually exceptionally good for kids. Um, as much as we don't think about it that way, you know, you get to stay up late, you get to eat a bunch of cheesecake or ice cream or whatever dairy products and, you know, have a fun time learning with friends. But I just get really excited about the possibility of taking holidays that have less of sort of a pre-established correct way of doing them in our collective consciousness and then, you know, creating our own. Because often with bigger ticket holidays, you know, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, uh, Passover, etc., I feel like we are so connected to, you know, the formula, you know, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, there's the whole liturgy. And even people that are progressive about it are still working from that framework and going with that. Passover, we've talked about, you know, we're ahead of the game compared to many holidays and people are experimenting, but still you've got your 15 parts of the Seder that are set up in in virtually every single Haggadah and people have a hard time really getting outside of that if they wanted to. But Shavuot, like, a, it's less liturgical in general. Even in in traditional circles, it's less about, you know, these are the words we must say, these are the rituals we must do. It's it's much more an experience of connecting to this idea of receiving the Torah. And, you know, in contemporary times, this there there's been this late night study ritual. And the idea that it's so open-ended for a lot of us really gets me stoked about what we could sort of fill in the gaps with. You know, it's like turning uh, lemons into lemonade. You know, the idea that this is sort of the probably the least observed or one of the least observed Jewish holidays can actually be turned to advantage in terms of creativity and saying, well, that makes it the most open to creativity. You know, so I, I think like as we look at how to be creative with it, I'm also looking a little bit into the past of how they were creative with it, right? Like the idea, as I think about Shavuot, is like Shavuot was the holiday at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple that I think was most temple-centric. And so when the temple was destroyed, it became the holiday that was most problematic, you know, least clear what it ends up becoming. And like we talked about in the last episode, Therefore, the main declaration of Shavuot from the Torah got moved to Passover. You know, like it was just it was an important piece of the holiday, but it got moved to Passover because people were like, well, I don't know what to do with this holiday anymore. Over time, because of that hint in the Torah that it had that it was sort of more or less around the time that the revelation at Sinai would have been in terms of its relationship with the Exodus of Passover, it it ended up being transformed by the rabbis to be this holiday that reenacts the revelation at Sinai. Now, this might be sort of a controversial way to say it in our time, but I would say that Shavuot is, again, the most problematic of the Jewish holidays, because if one of the issues that we're dealing with is that people basically don't believe in the revelation at Sinai, right, that, that the reality of the revelation at Sinai has been destroyed in people's lives, just as the Second Temple was destroyed, then Shavuot, which was that holiday that was about the revelation of the Torah, becomes now, again, the most problematic of the holidays. So what I'm trying to struggle with here is like, okay, so just as you said, it, it was the greatest opportunity because it was the least observed. In a way, I'm saying also there's the greatest opportunity because it's the most problematic. So what is the opportunity for, like, what do we need a holiday to do that no other holiday is doing in our time? I guess maybe that's the way to put it. 
Yeah, I I had a thought that I think actually reflects to something the original notion of Shavuot did well, and all of our biblical holidays did pretty well. I mean, we we sort of skirt over in modern day times how these were all agricultural festivals and how, okay, so we've got barley associated with Passover. And then we mentioned last episode, you know, grain, wheat associated with Shavuot. What, what I think that reflects on a, on a bigger level, it's less about, you know, the crops is that these holidays signify times of year and, and they absolutely were connected to sort of the broader context of that season in society. And, you know, Part of why our calendar as a year is unlike the Muslim calendar. Both of them build lunar associations in, but Muslims, you know, the holidays rotate around the whole year, and that's why Ramadan can be in different months. In Judaism, there seems to be this strongly held idea that I actually like that holidays need to be associated with certain times of year, that Passover needs to be in spring, that Hanukkah needs to be in winter. We've spoken about how Hanukkah, with being a festival of light, is serving a really important purpose in the dead of winter when we've got the least light of the year. I'm trying to think about the like Shavuot tends to come, it moves slightly, but it tends to come either very late spring or early summer. And I don't have exactly the answer for like what, what like broader societal anchor we would tie Shavuot to that would be similar to like harvest. But I feel like there's something there where Shavuot could be more tied to that shift from spring to summer. We get we get at that a little bit with Lag Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer counting, which often has been observed as like a field day and being outdoors and enjoying that entry into summer, which I'm kind of bummed about actually, because I'd like that. Like that would be the obvious answer to put that on Shavuot. And we sort of already have that in a different holiday. But maybe the answer is we we take that and put it on Shavuot because Lag Omer is maybe one of the only holidays that people have less of a consciousness of than than Shavuot. Um, but maybe the answer is also is that there's some other element of the summertime that we could play with here. I don't know. Yeah, I love that. I love the way you're going with that. I, I think that's that's really interesting, particularly, you know, it's funny, like growing up, I remember when um, every year the holiday of Tu Bishvat would come along. That's uh, generally around February. It's the new year for the trees uh, in the Jewish calendar. And I remember being in like a Jewish school and they would say, oh, well, you know, here in America, it's the middle of winter and it's not really the new year for the trees. That doesn't make any sense. But in Israel, it's more springtime. And so it would make a lot more sense. And it's like, OK, but like as a little kid, I was like that kind of didn't make a whole lot of impression. I'm like, okay, so this holiday just doesn't seem too relevant to my experience here in America. And it's really interesting to think about, right? Like we talk about um, Passover as a holiday of the springtime, but it's pretty much kind of in America, it's kind of touchy how springy it is when it's Passover. Um, but you're right. Like to, so, so in Israel, Shavuot is much more kind of in the heat of the summer, but here in America, it's much more around the real turn of the weather to be to be better. And I think that's really interesting to to think about how um, Shavuot might incorporate aspects of that. I also think about Sukkot and the idea that when we, um, if the idea is to actually live in your sukkah on the holiday of Sukkot in that temporary dwelling, but in in America, it's usually too rainy and too cold to really live outside in the sukkah. And so that aspect of the holiday of Sukkot isn't really experienced very much by American Jews. Now, now people talk about the holiday of Sukkot and say, well, but that's the whole point. The point is that life is fragile and it's not always, um, we're not always able to live in the comfort of our home and et cetera, et cetera. But realistically, it's too cold and too rainy. It's to an extreme for that to really work in the fall. It's interesting to think about what would it look like if we moved that piece to Shavuot um, and and that it was actually a holiday where we spent two days living outside. Um, You know, it's really it's really fascinating. So I, I love where you're going with the calendar. And then the question that I would also raise is kind of what do we need Shavuot to do internally? You know, and and um and I think it's something that we explored um back when we were talking about Hanukkah that the three major holidays seem to have shifted from being Passover, Shavuot and Sukkot to being Hanukkah, Yom Kippur and Passover. Um and 
you know, that the holidays play different roles. And so now Yom Kippur plays the role of sort of introspection. You know, maybe that used to be the role played more by Sukkot when you lived out in the in the world and you were subject to the to, to, to nature, you know, and and um, and Hanukkah seems to have become the time in which we focus on the fact that we're Jews, you know, the sort of a communal type of holiday, whereas that used to be Shavuot, you know, where you would make the pilgrimage. So it, so with all those shifts, you know, it's a question of kind of like, is there something either internal to us in our human lives or in terms of our communal lives that we really need a holiday to do? And and at least to my mind, the one thing that, that comes up, I don't think this, I don't know if this is the most important thing and I'm not asserting it. I'm just, the thing that comes up is is really to anchor it in this practice of staying up all night studying, right? Because yes, that emerged out of a understanding of Shavuot, that it was the reenactment of the revelation at Sinai, and therefore we should study the Torah. But I actually think that a holiday devoted to a sort of deep dive, a sort of extreme studying of Jewish content makes sense and is useful, whether or not it's actually a reenactment of the revelation at Sinai. Yeah, I totally agree. And just the reason that I connect to Shavuot so deeply is that I'm a nerd. And uh, the idea of spending a few hours um, with the texts of my choice, some of them are going to be Jewish texts, some of them are not. Like, um, and some of them might be literal book texts. Some of them will be, you know, online through our Shavuot Unbound piece, whatever. That idea actually gets me really excited, and I I recognize that's not quite universal, but there there are a lot of people that actually like nerding out and and learning text either independently or especially when you do so in communities. I mean, communities that have very few communities in the sense of synagogue congregations that have very few events, even if you're a very small synagogue, often have weekly Torah study. And I think that's a reflection that even as, you know, entire holiday, they might not have a Shavuot thing, by the way, these smaller congregations, they might, that might not be a holiday that's sort of big enough that they do anything. Um, But they very often do have study together. And I think that's something it, that uh, that registers for a lot of people and that might not and you know I often get pushed back like oh it's just sort of like an intellectual thing and like there are lots of people that won't want to and I say okay great like let's make sure that there are other ways of of having this holiday speak to people that are not just focused on you know the intellect but like I think that is an important thing and the other piece the last piece that I wanted to bring in is this very strange Hebrew language thing that I never knew about until I started learning a lot more, which is that Shavuot, the the exact same word with the same spelling means two totally different things, which is Shavuot means weeks, but it also means oaths in the sense of like an oath that you make. And it's talked about in the Torah. And you ask the question, like, what does Shavuot need to do for us internally? And I think it's far enough away from the high holidays that it actually could be in a meaningful sense, a chance to sort of think about whatever, whatever internal work we may have done on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, like a chance to sort of evaluate ourselves and think about how we've done on that. And also to look forward to the next one. I mean, traditionally people talk about how the holiday of the ninth of Av later in the summer, which is a fast day in, in certain senses, like kickstarts the, the lead up to the high holidays. But I think for a lot of people, it it doesn't really. Um, and there's and there's not really a meaningful reason why other than that, okay, I guess it's, you know, a couple months beforehand. Um, but Shavuot, if, if that other meaning of the word, which I'm not like doing some fancy linguistic thing, like this is actually the straightforward meaning of the term. If you had it in front of you without any context, it could mean either. Um, like, it's interesting to me that we haven't done anything with that and that no rabbis have like thought to make that a meaningful part of the holiday. You know, as we're talking, like I'm kind of intrigued by this idea that it's in that it becomes an outdoors focused holiday of of nerdy study, you know, and that there's somehow like some <laughs> combination of the mind and the body. And that maybe that's actually the holiday that we need, right? Maybe somehow it's a holiday in which we we somehow emphasize both. And, and I really like the the direction of that. I hadn't synthesized that. I had thought of those as two, but I, I do think there's something poetic in that combo. Um, we're 
excited to have these little mini episodes as a chance to rethink um, what holidays can mean for us. And um, we also want to make a plug that if you are enjoying this one, that you can totally participate in other of our Shavuot, uh, I don't know if it's programming or or stuff um but through our website and you can access that at judaismunbound.com it's called shavuot unbound and it's it's our homepage during shavuot so you won't have to navigate much farther than than that but um the other piece that we'd like to mention is that there are three other episodes mini episodes um where dan and i look at various features of this holiday of ours the first one was the one previous to this where we looked back at the history of shavuot but we have two others coming after this uh the first one looks at the role that dairy products play in this holiday why the heck do we have dairy late into the night on shavuot and the last one looks at the book of ruth which is traditionally associated with this holiday so we would love you to check those out and be in touch with us at dan at nextjewishfuture.org or lex at nextjewishfuture.org if you have thoughts feedback etc And uh, with that, this has been Shavuot Unbound.